Okay, that's fine. All right. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Excuse me. Yes. Thank you all for coming to this presentation. Uh, I'm Neil Ulrich, and I was a photographer and in related pursuits almost all of my life. Um, but this is about uh, my years in Indochina, which were actually uh, the last half of a very long war. And uh, um, having flunked my physical, pre induction physical, not once but twice, um, I thought, as a journalist, I really better see this. Okay. Okay, what button are we pushing here? Oh, here we go. Before I saw the war in Vietnam, I saw the war at home. I was going to school at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where the war was very unpopular, and uh, uh, working part-time for Associated Press, as mostly as a writer, but also taking some pictures. Protests against the war were growing. Not violent, most of them at first, sometimes funny. College student who can't spell missile. I always thought that was funny. <laughs> but it got darker and darker. Uh, and the anger with the war uh, grew. Police are carrying away a student named Paul Soglin from a demonstration. He later became the mayor of Madison three terms. <laughs> In 1967, the Dow Chemical Company sought to recruit at the business school. Students were not happy about that, to say the least. And there was a big sit-in at the business school where the interviews were supposed to be held. It was a big mistake to call the Madison police uh, perhaps the administration thought the campus police couldn't deal with it because it turned into one of the major uh, anti-war moments. It got bigger and bigger. That's the only time I've ever seen in my life I've ever seen a policeman using a sap. <laughs> um, and it became one of the major moments in the history of the University of Wisconsin that riot in 1967. And then I went to Vietnam. First as a freelance in 1970. I'd worked for AP as a writer before that. By 1970, Washington was trying to look for a way out. So my years there were colored by an increasingly desperate search for that exit strategy. The US had just invaded Cambodia to shut down the Hanoi supply lines. Journalists in Vietnam, in Hong Kong, where I lived then, said the end of the war was near, maybe just weeks away. Of course, that was pretty silly, but people were actually saying that. I did see the last two weeks of the war, but that was five years later. And of course, it did not end the way Washington wanted. Within days of my arrival, I made the rounds of news agencies in Saigon, and I was quickly on my way to Cambodia. In the Cambodian jungle, I found these young grunts rejoicing over ammunition found in the communist supply cache. This young soldier walked into Firebase Gondar in Cambodia with his unit. He said he had not changed his shirt in 45 days. Seemed proud of it. Well, do you know when there's a big operation going on, morale does improve. And that's one of the things that became very apparent to me. The days and weeks wore on. War became less strange to me. At My Lok, a village at the base in northern South Vietnam, a GI named Dino Schumacher departed uh, with his squad on a short security patrol. The monsoon rains had turned My Lok into a mud hole, and Dino stepped in a bad place. His squad went on. Three American servicemen teamed up to pull him out of the mud. It took 20 minutes. South Vietnamese soldiers mounted, moved piles of unspent artillery propellant propel, propel out of harm's way here. 
this is the, the sights and sounds of the war that I was seeing as a young guy with little experience with war uh, as we went onward. Artillerymen screwed fuses into shells on, uh, as both sides relied on long distance death to keep the other side Im immobile and if possible. But the hands reminded me of Michelangelo's God and man touching hands in the Sistine Chapel. The war seemingly had gone on forever by then, and it showed in the exhaustion and sadness of this South Vietnamese soldier at an isolated artillery base. He kept his gas mask close at hand because both sides were using tear gas, tear gas shells. More exhaustion. An American door gunner takes his time to light up his UH-1 helicopter, departed from Benoit Air Base to search for rocket launch sites used by the enemy the night before. Joe Galloway, among the first and foremost of Vietnam correspondents, said, hell, every Vietnam story begins or ends with a helicopter. In the Mekong Delta, the pilot of this OH-6 lost tail rotor function and returned to the airfield at high speed, the only way to preserve some semblance of control over the crippled machine. He touched down on tall grass next to the runway. He never saw that big rock hidden by grass, which demolished his bird. Neither the pilot or observer were injured, although obviously he was not happy. In his masterpiece, Slaughterhouse Five, the novelist and World War II veteran, Kurt Vonnegut, said all wars are fought by babies, and I think about that when I look at this image of crewmen refueling their Huey. Such young guys. Hanoi launched a massive offensive in 72, known to Saigon as the Easter Offensive. The provincial town of Quang Tri fell and thousands fled along Highway 1, easily within range of North Vietnamese artillery. It was slaughter. When, South, when Saigon troops fought a grinding battle to retake the town, they were met by the destroyed convoy of those who had sought to escape. Vietnamese searched the horrific debris along the highway for the remains of loved ones. U.S. and South Vietnamese jets supporting the battle to retake Quang Tri, which was a provincial capital, bombed the town to rubble. But pockets of North Vietnamese sheltering in the debris were stubborn. In exasperation, the U.S. tried a new, more or less experimental munition called the fuel air bomb. In midair, it split into three parts, each of which exploded into a cloud of flammable vapor, triggering a massive blast. It's the only time I ever saw that used. Ultimately, South Vietnamese troops regained the city, but Hanoi forces were just across the river at the edge of town. The wounding and killing went on. The human cost continued to be terrible. These somewhat puzzled Vietnamese were Chu Hoi's, defectors from the communist side. They were displayed to the press, somewhat suspicious. I asked one if he could break down his AK-47 rifle, and he did it in about 25 seconds. There was a rumor that the defection was temporary, that the Viet Cong had started using the Chu Hoi program as sort of R&R. &R. I... It's a wonderful story. I have no idea if it's true, and I sort of doubt it. <laughs> this image evoked for me the Pacific Island battles of World War II, where Marines with flamethrowers and tanks armed with the same horrific napalm weapons incinerated and intransigent Japanese in their bunkers and caves. The napalm tank showed up in Vietnam, but was used mainly to burn brush away from possible ammunition ambush sites and routes. America was pulling out of the war step by step. These battered jeeps were on their way home. U.S. Air helicopters especially were supporting South Vietnamese forces at all levels, provincial and national. A U.S. helicopter crewman contemplates the corpse of a Viet Cong killed by provincial troops 
and transported by helicopter back to base for reasons unknown. This picture always appealed to me as an image of the contemplation of mortality. Rarely did Grunts turn away from my camera. Usually it was the opposite. With our similar ages, providing a bond perhaps, or perhaps it was a mythos of the media, I had no idea, but it was always fun to meet them and photograph them. So when I was going out, as often as not, it was with South Vietnamese troops, although the air assets may have been US. We were on our way in a combat assault at this point and the landing zone was hot. It was a cemetery. <coughs> when I was a student at Madison, first of all, was anybody here? Anybody here was at Quezon? Okay. When I was a student at Wisconsin, I watched the nightly news and the battle for Quezon, I felt of all the battles, this one was a bad one to miss and I am by no means a war lover. Something about Quezon, like all the battles which live in history, from Troy, the siege of the Beijing legations, Gettysburg Midway, battles spread over centuries, even millennia, battles which I would have given anything to see and witness. Anyway, I was sitting in a bar in Madison, Wisconsin, when I watched the TV news of that. American troops reopened Quezon, a one-time coffee plantation, on a plateau near the Lao border, and I desperately wanted to be there. And I did go there the first day of reopening. A friendly helicopter pilot ignored an order initially barring press and took me there. Nothing happened that day, but there I was at Quezon, the battlefield of dreams, so to speak. These images, which I'm going to show you now, are from that time. Quezon was opened again as a forward base for the 1971 South Vietnamese invasion of Laos. It was called Operation Lam San 719 and aimed at shutting down for a while Hanoi's Ho Chi Minh logistics trail in Laos. And also, perhaps more importantly, a demonstration of Vietnamized warfare now that Washington was desperate to end American direct involvement in the endless war. Journalists were barred from crossing the border to cover uh, the ongoing battle in Laos. Uh, Lam San 719 uh, turned out to be a disaster. U.S. Army engineers using huge roam plows to reopen Route 9 to the Lao border. They posted this sign just short of Laos. On the ground, Lam San 719 was a South Vietnamese fight, but the U.S. provided cover, as I mentioned, across the border and into Laos. This border, this picture was taken just a few miles inside in Vietnam and a uh, helicopter was shot down. Well, nothing new about that. Normally a CH-47 would show up to pick it up if it was worth salvaging and take it for repair. Only this area was sort of hot, so they told a tank to crush it. <clears throat> At Quezon, a North Vietnamese rocket ignited the fuel line used to refuel helicopters. GIs scrambled to put it out. It was a very busy place, but it was constantly under uh, artillery and rocket attack. At Ham Ni, an adjacent South Vietnamese forward base, troops and supplies massed for the cross-border push, and the casualties were brought home. U.S. reconnaissance troops rescued by helicopter from a withering firefight are greeted by their mates at Quezon. They are so happy that they are all alive. I was just waiting for a lift back to Quang Tri at the uh, helicopter uh, pad when these guys stepped off the helicopter. It was an amazing sight. Journalists had little news of the battle on the other side of the border in Laos. One day near Ham Ni, I saw a South Vietnamese Huey starting up. I jumped aboard. The pilot asked if I had permission. Yes, I lied. We took off. I had no idea where we were going. I figured it was into Laos, but... After a short flight at low level, 
to avoid anti-aircraft fire, we landed at Hill 31, also known as Fire Support Base 31. It was a bright and clear day in the hills of Laos, and shortly I realized I was in the thick of it. The artillery base was built to support South Vietnamese ground troops fighting along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. By that time, February 14th, things had reversed. The base was a target for the enemy, and a dangerous place to be. This CH-47 approached quickly with a net load of 105 millimeter artillery ammunition, but instead of a gentle placement of the cargo, it dropped the ammo from about 30 feet or maybe a bit more and departed at high speed. The pilot clearly was warned enemy rockets were on the way. The South Vietnamese artillerymen started running for bunkers. Interesting in this picture, as you can see in the foreground, captured North Vietnamese weaponry, which was taken during the first part of the operation. The North Vietnamese had mainly pulled back, and once they got uh, an idea of exactly where things stood, then they came back and put the base under terrible uh, pressure. I put this prosaic picture in of the command bunker there simply because on that second step down is where I, I hid <laughs> as these rockets screamed in. These 122 millimeter rockets uh, sort of sound like a freight train coming down on your head if they're coming close. And that is what, is what it sounded like. One of those rockets hit a bunker 100 feet from me and killed everybody inside. Um, other people were killed or wounded in that attack. That was February 14th. February 25th, the North Vietnamese overran the base. What year was that, 1970? That's 71. Meanwhile, back in Saigon, Every year there's a holiday celebrating Tran Ong Dao, the 13th century Vietnamese general and hero who drove invading forces far out of the country. The Vietnamese man dressed in traditional garb punctures his cheap cheek as a ritual sign of mourning. In Cholan, the Chinese sister city of Saigon, the pious purchased huge incense coils to speed their prayers for an end of the war and the safety of their loved ones. But things were still going on along that border. I include this picture because, as you can see, over on the right-hand side, there's a truck with quad 50s and the words written on the shield saying, Paris Peace Talks. <coughs> Henry Kissinger, collars akimbo, arrives in Saigon to sell a peace agreement neither Hanoi nor Saigon found promising. U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam, Ellsworth Bunker, had just greeted him. By the way, this was another picture I wasn't supposed to have taken. Um, there was supposed to be no press coverage, but I had the habit of walking onto Tonsonu with uh, those big sound suppressing earmuffs and a tool bag, uh, so I looked like any other contractor. And uh, perhaps Kissinger is wondering who the hell is he? I have no idea. <laughs> Incidentally, you may have seen in the news that Kissinger is now 100 years old and he was spent this week in Beijing, where they have uh, traditionally, culturally, a great affection for, for age and old friends. <sighs> you know, Hanoi walked out of the talks with Kissinger, and angry Kissinger ordered the so-called 1972 Christmas bombing of Hanoi and Haiphong with B-52s. An AP a technician ready to transcribe the daily Hanoi newscast to see what news we might glean, glean from it. It was broadcast in Morse code, of all things. Type simply, no signal received. Hanoi had been bombed off the air. Ah. I'm afraid we have a video fault here for the uh, a brief video clip. Um, but I can tell you that it's showing 
correspondence at the fabled Five O'Clock Follies, uh, and which was usually a fairly sedate and brief briefing every day. But on this particular occasion, of course, the place was full. It was 110 degrees inside, and everybody was short uh, on the temper side. By January 29th, the accords were signed. And not long after the exchange of POWs, America held its breath as its own prisoners came home. And at various points in Vietnam, the Saigon side began the return of countless POWs to the north. On the Saigon side at Quang Tri City, a city devastated by the war, when the dust settled Saigon had regained control of the towns, South Vietnamese forces ferried POWs across the river to their own side, to the astonishment of the press covering the POW return, and I invited journalists to cross the river as well to witness the homecoming. Here the POWs are taking off their prison clothes and discarding them. They're down to their shorts as they prepare to go back to their own side. Many of them, halfway across the river, jumped out of the boats and ran to their own side. So I did get to the other side, on the North Vietnamese side, and this is what I saw. The prisoners are coming home. Some who couldn't walk or were wounded, of course, took the boats all the way across. And they were welcomed, just as our own POWs were welcomed, uh, with great love and uh, some surprise. The war was going on. Each side jockeying for advantage, a rattled South Vietnamese soldier viewed the aftermath of an ammo dump hit by communist rocket fire very close to Saigon. It was the beginning of the end by that time. Though I wonder what this pilot CO thought of that particular uh, uh, slogan on uh, the front of a Huey. The end, Laos. My work took me to Laos and Cambodia, though I was based in Saigon. Laos, that unfortunate sideshow, as Hanoi rolled a victory in Vietnam and the monstrous Khmer Rouge gained in Cambodia, it seemed Laos was perhaps a soft landing of the new managers. On my last visit to Laos, I was there for the annual rocket festival. Pat at Lao frowned their way among the drunks and bawdy jokesters. The Laotians built these phallic rockets to launch into the monsoon clouds, better to trigger rains, very sexy. That's a rocket he's holding. And they'd shoot them like that. But they weren't reliable. This one blew up on the pad. And if you look closely, you can see one Lao being blown off the uh, frame and another one is holding on. I rushed up to the one who was blown off. He was sitting there dazed and asked him, are you okay? He said, Bo Yang, which is Lao for never mind. But fun and games. The Pat at Lao were, however, on the march in Laos. At a provincial town in Laos, everybody thought it was great fun. All the young people climbed on top of Pat at Lao, a Vietnamese tank, as they came into town. It was a soft landing for some, but not for this man. It was Tubi Le Fung. He was a respected French-educated leader among the Hmong people in the Laotian uplands. The U.S. had pushed him out in favor of another leader, the aggressively anti-communist Vang Pao. Tubi Le Fung, he was a dignified old man. The communists uh, spirited him off to a prison in the hills and killed him. Cambodia, the end. I was in Phnom Penh on a routine administrative visit um, as the battle clearly was approaching an end. And then the North Vietnamese launched their big offensive, which ended uh, the war in Vietnam. 
So at that point, I immediately went back to Saigon. Um, and I was not there for the end in Cambodia. These are close to the end, as you can see. This Buddhist temple is nothing now. It's all shattered and it was a, the war was getting closer and closer to Phnom Penh. This man is named Doug Sapper and ammo is cooking off. We could hear it from Phnom Penh. I drove to the airport, Phuketong Airport, outside Phnom Penh. A target now is the Khmer Rouge advanced. When I got there, I saw Doug, who was an American soldier of fortune, well known to the press, desperately trying to move crates of ammunition away from the flames. An incoming rocket had triggered a growing fire in an ammunition dump at the airport. Duck said he had an interest in this modified DC-4 Guppy, once built as an automobile transport and now used for cargo transfer. The airplane was close to the growing ammo fire and we all knew how this was going to end. As you can see, there's an explosion, some of the stuff cooking off until the big one. Um, looking back on it, I'd have to say to anyone that walking into a burning ammunition dump is not very smart. <clears throat> Vietnam, the end. And this is the, the end that all Americans had their eyes on. In those last days and weeks, when it appeared that this would be the end of the war, people were desperate to get out. And some were desperate to get in, you know, journalists and a few others, maybe others who had uh, some relationship in Vietnam and they wanted to try to evacuate those people involved. At any rate, many came in. These are journalists and over on the right hand side, that's Hunter Thompson. And this was the last day, the evacuation. It's impossible really to orchestrate an evacuation properly, which made me think that the Afghan evacuation so many years later, a difficult uh, act to pull off for anyone. At any rate, um, my small part in this was to go to a bus stop, be picked up with others who wanted to be evacuated and taken to the Tatsunut Airport where we'd get aboard helicopters and be flown to naval um, assets off the coast. There, uh, by the time that happened, the city was in chaos and the airport was in flames, having taken many artillery hits. So the bus just rode or drove around, drove around, and we didn't know what to do. Went to the docks, which were even more and more chaotic, then left there, and an older correspondent named Kai's Beach, who had gotten a Pulitzer Prize in Korea uh, at a stop he called his friends in the CIA, who said, come to the back of the embassy. And that's where the bus took us. There's a huge crowd of Vietnamese there. They did not interfere as we walked and moved our way through the crowd towards the wall, where the Marines pulled us over one by one. <clears throat> so I'm going to um, look at pictures from another way now. The pictures that I've shown you were basically the stuff of daily news coverage. The pictures often ended up in the newspapers within 24 hours or a bit more. But I was also taking pictures of almost everything, um, mainly because that was the way I took pictures. And I was thinking a lot of this stuff is going to be interesting as side notes and the background to history in the years and decades that come, uh, that follow this event. So we're gonna look at some that I still regard as people, artifacts, and hardware for history. This wide angle picture was at the uh, North Vietnamese news conference Saturday morning after 73, um, both sides opened up liaison offices in their respective capitals, and we visited the North Vietnamese once a week for their press conference. It was useless for news, but on the other hand, you doesn't not go because who knows, they might say something. <laughs> and that man in the foreground was a senior colonel named Vodong Jong, 
who smoked his way through their official statements and could be very charming um, afterward. Um, after the war, the uh, North Vietnamese made him more or less regent in Cambodia after the North Vietnamese troops uh, invaded Cambodia. Uh, and he died not long after that from smoking. I always carried a Polaroid camera. As my boss, Horst Foss, said, he's in the wrong job. He loves photography. So when someone would come into the photo department, I'd automatically pick mine up and say, just hold it, I'd make a snap. From the upper left, that's Peter Arnett, one of the more well-known known names of correspondence in Vietnam. And Sarah Webb Burrell, she was a Vogue model and came to Vietnam as a photographer. David Burnett, Time Life, an excellent photographer. And in a saucy pose, that's Barbara Gluck Treister. She was married to a New York Times correspondent, Joe Treister, and took pictures for the Times. In the lower uh, row, the cleaning lady, uh, an image of dignity. Next to her is Kenyan, one of our photo stringers. Turned out to be a North Vietnamese spy. <laughs> on the other hand, he, was, he must have been a very low-ranking spy in as much as there was nothing to spy on in our bureau. Jacqueline Desdam, a French-Vietnamese beauty who was a reporter for the U.S. Overseas Weekly, and Hunter Thompson. Saigon above during the war, Saigon below somewhat after the war, as you can see below. Buildings are beginning to rise. It's no longer the low-level French city. Um, it's increasing in altitude year by year. Um, but let's look at a few of the items, or a few of the buildings there. In the center, that was where AP and many news organizations had their offices. It's called the Eden Building, how misnamed. And, uh, um, just to the right of that, in white, is the uh, Continental Palace Hotel, which had uh, an open-air bar and was one of the great places for spooks and correspondents and everybody else to have a drink. Over on the lower right... On the veranda. I'm sorry? I said on the veranda. Ah, right. right. The Continental Shelf is what it was known as. <coughs> In the lower right was the uh, Opera House, which in South Vietnam was repurposed to the National Assembly. And over in the lower left was where the famous five o'clock follies were held every day. Oops. Kiosk. It was a kind of thing, not a news picture, but it was a kind of thing that I had to photograph very simply because it, this said Vietnam, said Saigon during the war. It was one of those things you hardly notice. But it was sort of a unique, to, uh, a unique presence to the place. Anyway, you could get everything you wanted there, more or less, including tot size military uniforms, belt buckles, uh, stolen Zippo lighters, and no end of patches, uh, most of which were salacious or uh, funny and uh, snapped up by GIs. A sadder picture. These were photographs of North Vietnamese uh, that were handed to me by um, a South Vietnamese soldier. Uh, apparently the people involved were casualties in a battle. The watering holes, Romuncho where press and military would go for lunch, and uh, the patron would gladly so show you an x-ray of his arm, which had been shot by a burglar. Ramoncho was a literary, uh, fictional literary figure, well known in France. That man in the center is Jean Tave. He had been in Vietnam his, almost, uh, his entire adult life. He was a Corsican, and he ran the Royal Hotel, over there on the right side, which was the place to be at noon for uh, a lunch. Everybody showed up there, military, 
journalists, contractors, and so on. The uh, uh, waiters all wore boiled white shirts and wore black ties. And Moya Neild, who was a, the wife of an AP correspondent, asked me just to take a snap of the place, and it turned into one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> he died before the end of the war. The story was that every day after uh, the lunch crowd left, he'd go up to his room there where his, his young wife would prepare a few pipes of opium for him. Um, but before he died, the French made him a member of the Legion, gave him the Legion of Honor. More Polaroids. <clears throat> Henry Cam in the upper left. In the upper right is Sid Shanberg. They're, they're reporting on Cambodia was excellent. It shamed the world with the news of what was going on there. Itty Letterer of AP, when AP started uh, uh, sending women correspondents to Vietnam. Master John Blystone, his mother Hella's in the background. Which one is he? I'm sorry? Which one is he in the lower left? Or which, which picture? Is that okay, uh, Master John Blystone is top row, second from uh, right. Okay? Yeah, his father was Dick Blystone of AP, who later was one of Ted Turner's first hires for CNN News. <laughs> Lower row, Maurice Cavallari, who operated the hotel um, constellation in Vientiane, Laos, which was always a place where impecunious an inexperienced press such as myself were welcomed. Um, he was great. He also had the uh, corner on illegal money changing in Laos. So when the communists took over and the advisors suddenly were Russian, they were changing their money with him as well. Next to Maurice is Francoise de Mulder. She was a uh, photojournalist and always of good cheer, never cynical. Her work was wonderful. She was the first woman some years later to win the World Press Photo Award, very prestigious. Jack Foisey, the LA Times, who addressed all people such as myself as father. Uh, and in the lower right is Philip Jones Griffiths, a photographer who is one of the, the best image makers of Vietnam very early on in the war. Artifact, lotion money. This isn't money, this is a work of art. It's spectacular. I'm afraid this is followed by another video clip in, which may not be working okay, but at any rate, I always carried an 8mm movie camera. That wasn't my job, but just to take more pictures and do more things. And one of the um, reasons uh, is that uh, it was fun. But uh, as you can see, we're not going to see that clip, so we're going to have to go on. Um, Bodong Zhang, whom I told you about a few minutes ago, senior North Vietnamese officer, was utterly charming, um, good man to have in the job. And uh, basically, they were there until the end of the war. They hid in their bunkers while Tonsonut was bombarded. And then when the bombarding stopped, they got out and realized that their side had won. He's surrounded by journalists from several different countries at this press conference. Uh, the Paris Peace Accords were bringing senior officers together in images we never thought we'd see. In this case, uh, they were discussing implementation of the accords departures of the American. That was one of the biggest um, problems in the Paris Peace Accords. You know, the North Vietnamese said, okay, end of the war, you leave. And we said, okay, end of the war, your troops go back to North Vietnam. North Vietnam. Of course, the Vietnamese attitude was, it's our country, why should we leave? Um, and that was the main reason for the uh, North Vietnamese walking out. Uh, and later being, uh, later coming back after the Christmas bombing. This North Vietnamese officer on the right, his name is Bui Tin. 
and he was a very senior officer. In fact, he was the guy who nominally accepted the South Vietnamese surrender. Um, charming, fluent in multiple languages, he became the highest ranking defector from Hanoi. Uh, not too long after the war, he said he had enough. He was very unhappy with Chinese and Russian influence, and he spent the rest of his life in Paris. Many of the striking images of the war over many years came out of this office. This was the photo office in the AP, in the Eden Building. And in the center of the typewriter is Horst Foss, my boss and mentor. Um, there was a rumor that we had posted in the office pictures of terrible mangled bodies and all awful stuff. And it, no. We certainly didn't. All those pictures on the wall are basically a, pictures of some of our staffers who were wounded and being brought back to safety. Was that you on the left? Go back. Is that you on the left? No, that's a, a, an editor named uh, Carl Robinson who lives in Australia now. Mm -hmm. On the right is a Japanese photographer who worked for us. Dang Van Phuc, a very brave Vietnamese photographer who worked for us, lost an eye um, in combat. This is Nick Ut. Um, Nick Ut took that picture of the napalm girl. His brother, Huynh Tan Mi, worked for us as a photojournalist. He was covering South Vietnamese, North uh, Viet Cong fighting um, not very far from Saigon, he was wounded and he was set down with other wounded to wait for evacuation when the North Vietnamese or Viet Cong overran the base and killed all, uh, everyone they found. So, Nick Ut, who was a kid at the time, was hired with the proviso he would work in the darkroom and never ever go out to combat, uh, shoot combat for obvious reasons. The family had lost enough. Uh, that's uh, Lu Sai. All of these pictures that uh, were developed and printed, he did much of it. Well, about Nick, o Nick Ut again, by the time I got to Vietnam, Nick was going out every day to take pictures. <laughs> that had changed. <coughs> this impossible machine is what we use to send pictures. Um, the world had satellite technology, but civilians in Vietnam did not. Um, so to send a picture out the same day, we had to make a small print, which would be wrapped around that drum at the lower right. And we plugged that machine into the post office's shortwave transmitters and sent the picture by shortwave to Tokyo, where it was, the signal was picked up, sent on to New York by satellite. London by satellite. The quality was simply awful. Anytime there's a lightning uh, strike, it would be a, there'd be a line in the picture. Sometimes we had to send pictures two or three times to get one usable picture out. And uh, other times, it just didn't work at all. In Phnom Penh, the electricity was a sometime affair. This is Dennis Neeld, who was typing out a story and uh, uh, we had a shaky teletype line from Phnom Penh out to Bangkok. For photos, they all had to go to Saigon or Bangkok for further transmission. I knew, made the acquaintance of a Vietnamese named Nguyen Hai Chi. He was a premier editorial cartoonist in Vietnam and uh, both sides hated him. Uh, he was uh, totally um, unbiased in his presentation of both South Vietnamese and North Vietnamese leaders, mm -hmm. and consequently, um, during and after the war, I think he spent some time in jail on b both sides. At any rate, they let him out. His cartoons were absolutely devastating, oftentimes quite salacious, and uh, after I met him, I. 
acquire about 60 of them. But this gives you an idea of the kind of thing he was producing. Here's an aerial artifact. Now, when I took a quick snap of this at Thompson Newton while I was there for some other reason, um, I figured it was a C-46. A lot of them left over from the war, um, only it wasn't. I looked at the negatives later, and there are four engines, not two. It turned out to be a Boeing S-307. This is definitely aviation artifact country. Only 10 were ever built. It was a B-17 airframe, gussied up to be a pressurized airliner, the first pressurized airliner. Um, Pan Am and TWA bought nine of the 10. Howard Hughes bought one. He was going to fly it around the world. And then World War II inconveniently put that idea on hold. So all the airplanes were drafted. And after the war, many of them ended up in Southeast Asia under various CIA schemes. CIC, as you see on the table, stands for um, the equivalent of International Commission of Control. So it was pay taking peacekeepers around. Um, at any rate, uh, all of them crashed with the exception of one. Uh, loss of, they were not maintained properly, loss of life. Most of them crashed in Cambodia. There's one left. It's in the Udvar Hazy Museum in Washington. The people I met, the people I worked with were fascinating. It was Gloria Emerson of the New York Times. We'd been doing coverage and we got completely soaked by a typhoon. And we were waiting for a lift from a marine base back to Da Nang. Toshio Sakai of UPI photos, he was a, in every sense a samurai. Even tempered, friendly, and absolutely great with his cameras. He won the Pulitzer for his work in Vietnam. George Lewis of NBC News. This is at Quezon, and you can see the kind of gear that crews were carrying before video. 16 millimeter sound on film. Can you imagine carrying a camera like that into combat? Well, the TV crews did. How many of you were in Saigon at any point? Okay. At the uh, Caravelle Hotel, across the street from the Continental Palace, which was another uh, hangout for the press. Very good hotel. High above the hotel, on the top, was this cutout of a caravel, Portuguese ship. And it must have weighed a ton. It was huge. Uh, one night coming back from dinner, I noticed that the moonlight was shining through it, so I immediately got my tripod and long lens and produced that picture. It's another artifact picture. Years later, I went back to Saigon, and I stayed at the Caravelle. I talked to the manager, a European, who had no idea what I was talking about when I mentioned this, and he summoned this absolutely ancient and a uh, junior employee uh, who said, yeah, it was taken down after the war, disappeared, it had been there forever. Nobody noticed it because it was all the way up there. One last Polaroid portrait. His name was Michel Laurent. He was French, wiry little photographer. He worked for AP and then went to a news agency. He won the Pulitzer Prize in Bangladesh, a joint prize that was given to him and Horst Foss. And I put this picture in here because he was the last of the correspondents to die in that war. He went out to cover a battle outside of Saigon two days before the end, a battle by that point that had no significance whatever, and he was killed. I went back to Vietnam years later for a reunion and went to the top of the Caraville uh, when a storm was coming in and photographed all the places I knew, plus the lightning. I was only about 20 feet, really, below the place where that metal caravel had been, that ghostly caravel had been before it was taken down. Thank you very much for your attention.
do you have any questions for Neil? <coughs> Look in the back. Can I comment on something? I'm sorry. Uh, Just to comment on something. You had mentioned before that the rockets that were sent out by the North Vietnamese sounded like a freight train. If you're if you're close, yeah. Okay, I've been in touch with a lot of Marines and in country army guys that told me the same thing about naval rounds that came from the ships, especially the uh, battleship and the cruisers. And they said exactly the same thing, that it sounded like <coughs> a train coming through. Yeah, that last couple of seconds um, was, you know, on the other hand, if you didn't hear it, you were probably dead. So, <laughs> um, And uh, they were a very inexpensive weapon to produce and could be fired from a very inexpensive launcher. Yeah, I so, that. so they were all over the place. Okay, yeah, it's just something, that, it's just a comment I didn't want to have, uh, you know, go back and forth about it could have been, you know, how did you know which side to duck? Right, it was pretty much an area weapon. Okay. Um, and so when that one hit the bunker 100 feet from me, well, it was a very unlucky shot for those in the bunker. Um, uh, here. Another, well, Jim. Those photos are technically perfect. I mean, perfect tonal range. Who, who did the darkroom work? Oh, um, well, there was a picture uh, that I showed of our darkroom technician who was evacuated uh, at the end of the war and ended up doing stills for Warner Brothers for <laughs> the rest of his career. But in, so the pictures that we made, the prints that we made in Saigon were of very high quality principally because the quality would certainly go downhill in the transmission process. Uh, for very important pictures, uh, news pictures, we sent them or tried to by um, uh, the shortwave radio. That picture Nick Ut took of um, Kim Fook running down the road after the napalm attack, that was sent about mid-afternoon. If we waited until late, afternoon or evening, the atmospherics were such that the shortwave connection was impossible. Also, we made eight by 10 prints, and they were also very high quality, which were air freighted to Tokyo, where we did have a satellite connection. But in terms of this material here, I always, carry, uh, I always kept my negatives very carefully, and uh, over the years, I'd go through them just to make sure that the time was not, dis the days and months and years were not destroying the negatives, and I digitized uh, those that I found significant. That's what we saw. Yeah, those are all images that I've digitized. But yes. Is this presentation? I'm about, sorry. I'm sorry. I had is too much this, fun in Vietnam. My <laughs> hearing is gone. Is this it's those freight trains? <laughs> right. Is this pr uh, presentation backed up anywhere? Is it in a museum or any place? Actually, this particular presentation is someone I've uh, put together after a number of lesser presentations over the years. I, not too long ago, I went to Texas for a presentation at the Vietnam Center, and I thought I really it ought to start going back over this material and working on it. Uh, well, there are a number of copies around because I, I'm always ever, ever present, petrified of the idea of something unique being lost. So yes, there are copies around. In fact, we have video recording it. All of our talks, we video record them, and beginning beginning of next week, we'll have it mounted on YouTube on our museum YouTube channel. So you'll be able to watch that again. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, Neil, I saw a lot of that was black and white. Um, did you was that easier to use? or color come around later, especially like Polaroids. I thought Good was, point. Good. Was, was, I always thought it was color. <laughs> right. But they're really sharp, so I didn't know the advent of color. Does that come later? Or? Good question. At that point, um, 90, I'd say 90% of the work we did was in black and white. Anything in color, uh, you know, maybe if I was carrying three cameras, one would have color. Uh, would be air freighted to New York. But at that point, that was before USA Today. Remember USA Today was an absolutely revolutionary change 
Now, suddenly they were putting color on the page, front page every single day and newspapers all over the United States began to emulate that and so the interest and um, need for color increased. But in Vietnam, no. Um, you know, the uh, news magazines, of course, which of course were all color, they all air freighted their uh, undeveloped film to New York. Uh, but in terms of uh, our work, it's black and white. Now, could you send, could you send a uh, picture by color in using our shortwave technology? Uh, it would be agony because the quality was so bad. Mm -hmm. You have to, first of all, you have to break down the picture into four separations, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black which would be recombined at the newspaper. Uh, life's a lot easier now. Yeah. And, um, the New York Times ran an article about that, <coughs> the napalm girl. Right. And as a mature woman, and it's very interesting, it's a similar, I'm not sure how long ago it was, it might have been six months ago, but you could find it. But it was a good uh, biography of a profile. Right, she and Nick would keep in close touch. I've never met her. Um, after the war, of course, she became sort of an icon among the Vietnamese for cruelty of war um, and uh, the effort that was made to rehabilitate her. Uh, the, as I recall, she was sent to Cuba for additional medical treatment. Um, there are many steps into this, but in Cuba, I believe she defected uh, and ended up in Canada. Um, and uh, so that's how she ended up outside of the North Vietnamese orbit, so to speak. Uh, yes. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about your work in Thailand that led to the Pulitzer Prize. Oh, well, after the Vietnam War, uh, AP um, transferred me to Bangkok uh, with the assumption that, uh, uh, well, Bangkok had really good aerial communications and that most of the news that I would have to cover would be in the surrounding region. Thailand was fairly stable. And um, I thought that was a great idea. Um, it turned out that much of the news that I was covering was in fact from in Thailand. <laughs> um, the political situation had been hotter and hotter in Thailand um, between right wing um, students who were basically vocational students and mm -hmm. university students who were left doing and wanted the Americans out uh, until one day, and we've been covering this story all along, of course, mm -hmm. I got a call from one of our reporters, a Thai, who said, there's big trouble on campus right now. And so I immediately grabbed my cameras and got in a taxi cab and went to Thomas Hutt University. What he didn't tell me when he called me at 7 a.m. was that it had been going on since 2 a.m. <laughs> and, and that he had come back to the bureau to write a story and called the bureau chief who asked him, by the way, did you call Yulovich? He said, no. <laughs> so he called me and said um, things were going on and I got there coincidentally as all the trouble was peaking. Some correspondents had been there for hours and left. Um, and so when I got there, the shoot, there was a lot of shooting and a lot of people being killed. Um, and uh, not too long after that, the leftist students on campus um, dis, uh, surrendered. Uh, and uh, uh, I stuck around to photograph all of this. And then I thought, I really have to leave because somebody is going to come up to me and say, film. Um, so I went to the gate and saw a commotion under one of the trees, these beautiful trees at the edge of this big park, San Umluang, and went over there and saw a man had been hanged. Uh, there were two such events very close together. And, uh, you know, I, I went up to see this and photograph this and I thought, anybody looking at me? You know, <laughs> the situation was total anarchy. So. I took a few frames and then got in a bureau, got in a taxi cab across the street, went back to my office where they were operating with information that was hours old. And I said, um, 40, 50 dead at least on campus and um, at least two people lynched. Um, and the bureau chief was an excellent newsman, excellent journalist. Well, he didn't disbelieve me, but it was so hard to accept 
because everybody else had come back with stories that weren't nearly as bad from beforehand. So I said, I've got to get this film out of the country now. I'll, you can look at the film in 10 minutes after it's developed. And so at that time, to send pictures from Bangkok, uh, we had to make a print and send it down to the post office and send it as a radio telegram. Uh, we could not legally send it from the office. So um, I made the two most significant pictures in prints and then sent them by messenger down to the post office where I thought there was a very good, re very good chance of them saying, forget it, we, we can't send that. Well, it turned out when the messenger came back, I asked him what the reaction was and they said, he said, oh, they thought it was a great picture. <laughs> So we managed to send 17 pictures by this means before the government did close down communications for that day. We got all of our pictures out. The alternative would have been to give all the negatives to uh, my wife or somebody else and wait till they reopened the airport and then hand carry them out. Um, the, uh, there was a story. The police went around to all the Thai newspapers confiscating their negatives of what had gone on. I'm not so sure that that was accurate because years later I saw a lot of Thai newspapers and they did have very dramatic photo coverage of that event. Uh, but at any rate, we got our pictures out and then I could breathe a certain sigh of relief that I had not taken those images for nothing. Please. Uh, back to the napalm girl, was that shot in color or was it- Black and white. Lines? No, it was black and white. Uh, and the story uh, was rather bizarre. Nikot came back. Uh, he was standing with a lot of other journalists, you know, including David Burnett, as I had mentioned in the Polaroid portrait, an excellent photographer. David Burnett was reloading his camera when that little girl ran down the road. At any rate, so Nikot comes back. I was not there, by the way. I was in the United States. I returned to Vietnam a few days later. And all of this I picked up from my friends, including Nick. So the film was developed, and Carl Robinson, the editor over on the left-hand picture in the uh, image I showed you, said, oh, no, we can't use that. It has full frontal nudity. AP policy is that we don't have pictures of full frontal nudity. And of course, come on, Carl, this is one of the greatest pictures ever made. and. Uh, uh, not too long after that, Horst Foss came back from uh, his well-watered lunch at the Hotel Royale uh, and uh, took a look at the negative and, of course, immediately overrode uh, the junior editor's um, decision and alerted New York that we had a picture that was coming that was absolutely mind-boggling. And happily, we were able to actually transmit that picture out to uh, the world and it got out okay. You know, no lightning streaks or atmospherics. <clears throat> Any other question? One last note about the napalm girl. The picture was taken at a place called Train Bang. That's right. Which is on the main road between Saigon and Tay Ninh, one of the westerly. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Right. And uh, it was. Uh, it was on a main road, and it was a constant focus of skirmishing uh, both sides. I'd go up there now and then. One day I went up there with Nick Ut. This was long after he had taken that picture of the napalm girl. And of course, we separated. No point having two photographers in the same spot at the same time. And uh, uh, he was wounded uh, by a mortar burst about 100 yards from me. And uh, I was photographing building burnings, and you know the usual, usual. And anyway, the last, uh, the next thing I saw was two of his friends supporting him as he came back down to where I was. And it didn't look like a bad wound. It was a piece of shrapnel in the leg, so which he's still carrying there, by the way. And uh, we got into the jeep and drove back to Saigon like mad to get him to a hospital, where they X-rayed it and said probably a lot safer to leave it in there. So he's still carrying that. And that was at Trang Bang again. Uh, Nick, isn't he still an active journalist? 
here in the U.S.? Not really, no, no. I take pictures almost every day of one thing or another, but uh, my journalism days are pretty well behind me. But how about Nick Wu? Oh, Nick will shoot pictures every single day. He retired from AP. AP, right. Yeah, he retired from AP, but I see his work frequently. We, AP has this geezer blog that uh, we contribute to now and then. And so he's always, he's always photographing wildlife, or he's got this spot at near LA airport that is brilliant for showing airplanes uh, silhouetted by a full moon. Uh, yes, he's shooting pictures all the time. Professionally, I don't think so, but mostly in retirement. One question for everyone. How many, raise your hand if you served in Vietnam at all. So you can kind of see our interest. And again, just Did looking at it, it covers uh, everything. Uh, uh, Navy, uh, uh, Air Force, uh, Army, uh, just literally everything. English teacher. And yes, and an English <laughs> teacher as well. Uh, but Neil, thank oh. you so much. For well, thank you very us, much. I hope you'll visit with us around here. Well, support. thank you so much. Well, one question yes. for all the Vietnam uh, people, uh, people with Vietnam experience: How do we get so old? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you for your attention. Thank, and thank you. you very much. I'm sorry about problems with those short videos. It's okay. It, things still held together. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah, older versions of PowerPoint don't show the video.